one grade that happened this week. I've got some uh, data I'd like to share. One thing I was thinking about was how tied the age of Congress is to our fiscal spending problem. If you think about someone who's young, they're going to want to invest for their future and think about the future. If you're someone who's old, you live for the day and you don't think about the future. And I worry so much that the aging of the establishment that makes the decisions about how money is spent creates a, a psychological a barrier incentive. Yeah, or they, positioning that's all about giving away all the money today instead of making the right decision to make sure that we have a prosperous tomorrow. And that's why I think so many of these things kind of slip through. If you put a 20-year-old in charge that was well-informed in charge of some of the fiscal policy, environmental policy, energy policy decisions, defense policy, it would be a very different set of decision-making than someone who's in their 80s. Inheritance tax. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so pensions. anyway, we should talk. Like, you want to talk about the Fitch downgrade? Because I think it's a really important story this week. Fitch, the rating agency, downgraded the US's long term debt by one notch from AAA to AA. Only nine countries have AAA ratings from the top three rating agencies SP Global, Fitch, and Moody's. Those are Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Singapore, and Australia. What you can take from that is you got to have a good balance sheet and you have to have high functioning governments. The highest functioning governments in the world are the Nordics. That's why you see Denmark, Netherlands, Sweden, Norway there. According to NPR, the negative reaction hasn't been as strong as uh, 2011. That was the first time the US was downgraded from AAA to AA plus by the S&P. That also had to do with the debt ceiling. The markets kind of shrugged off, largely shrugged off the Fitch downgrade. Main reasons for the downgrade is obviously higher interest rates, aging population, the debt to GDP ratio, which we've talked about here. But government kept coming up over and over again and how dysfunctional our government is. And the debt ceiling is one of the key manifestations of that. Your thoughts on this? For the first half of the show, Freeberg, you're an optimist, but are you now going to switch to declinist? I wouldn't say declinist. Are you going to switch to declinist mode now, or are you still in optimist mode? I mean, in Jake Hal's view, unless you're a cheerleader for every stupid government policy, it's you're silly, a Hall. declinist. I know. It's, it's a, Jake Hal, listen, it, I want to be honest. I, I don't think so. I think he, like, and I, I concur, I think you can highlight that there are concerns with U.S. fiscal policy that are putting okay. us in decline in our spending spiral with mm -hmm. the U.S. currency reserves, which there are now diversification efforts underway, and I'll talk about this in one second. And that doesn't mean that the U.S. isn't the most exceptional place to do engineering and entrepreneurism and have freedom of speech and thought and so on. But there are elements of the U.S. that put things at risk. So let me just point out these two charts. If you guys pull the first one up, this is a, a pretty striking chart. And I think I showed this before. This is federal government interest payments that are being made. We're, we're now up to you know, a trillion dollars. The chart, as you can see, a year uh, has spiked. And by the way, that number is spiking further. And we'll talk about this in one second, as a result of rising interest rates and increased fiscal spending. So this is now becoming a pretty sizable part of our budget. And as of now, paying the interest on our debt is a larger capital outlay for the federal government than defense spending. The second chart shows what happened in the last week, which is that 30 year treasuries have been sold off. And as that's happened, treasury yields have climbed. So there's been about a 10% decline in pricing and a you know a concurrent nearly 10% increase. And Bill Ackman, you know, basically said today that he's shorting 30-year treasuries. He thinks we're going to go to five and a half percent long-term rates. Currently, the 30-year treasury is sitting at 4.3. And remember, I told you guys this after this thing I went to a few weeks ago that there were two prominent economists who shared that they think we're going to be facing long-term rates in the five to seven percent range, very long-term rates for a very long period of time that it is a new fiscal regime. And then if you pull up the last link I sent, Nick, this is a report made by the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee of the Treasury Department. And I just want to read a couple of quotes from this report. This just came out uh, today, and it was published. Uh, it was sent over to the Secretary of the Treasury yesterday. And it said, since the uh, Advisory Committee com convened in May, two-year Treasury yields are about 100 basis points higher, while 10-year Treasuries have increased by about 40 basis points. The bank holdings of non-mortgage-backed government securities, mainly treasuries, have actually declined by $146 billion so far this year. So that means banks are selling off their treasuries. The committee goes on to say, at the same time, 
Treasury investors have noted the Treasury supply will need to increase to address the rise in public deficits as tax revenues have come in weaker and government spending has increased. Issuance needs will be additionally impacted by the timing of a recession, so on. Then they said, based on the marketable borrowing estimates published on July 31st, Treasury, this is crazy, Treasury currently expects privately held net borrowing of $1.007 trillion in this quarter with an assumed end of September cash balance of 650. And then they said, we expect another $852 billion of borrowing next quarter. That means Treasury is going to try and issue and sell $2 trillion worth of Treasury bonds in the next two quarters. That's $2 trillion of new borrowing by the federal government to pay our bills. At the start of the year, they were estimating $1.6 trillion for the year, which was an insane number. Now we're talking about $2 trillion in just two quarters. So rates are climbing. As a result, we need to borrow more. And this is a perfect manifestation of the debt spiral problem that we've talked about multiple times. Our fiscal spending outlay and the rising interest rates combine to create an insurmountable debt spiral that is now manifesting in the fact that we need to sell $2 trillion of um, treasuries. And here's the crazy statistic that they said. In reviewing recent demand for US treasuries in auctions, the committee noted that an increasing percentage of supply is being absorbed by investment funds, while foreign participation has remained range bound. That means as we're trying to sell more treasuries, governments, federal, foreign governments are buying fewer of them, which means that the US currency as a reserve is no longer the place that everyone wants to plow their money as much as it used to be. It is in decline. Now, uh, the other thing I want to share, which I think is is absolutely critical, is how do we address this gap? Well, the one way is these entitlement programs. And so several Republican presidential candidates, Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis, and Mike Pence, have all publicly stated on the, the campaign trail that they're promoting programs to cut Social Security benefits for people that are 30 and 40 years old. And here's the response to that. So, so they've gone out and they've started saying that. A poll was done. And on that poll, 82% of voters oppose the push to cut Social Security for Americans under 50, 82%. So where is this going to take us? This is what is so scary to me, J. Cal. I'm not an American declinist. I believe in the American system. It benefited me and my family. But I do worry that we find ourselves in a whirlpool that it's very hard to get out of because the populace says we don't want to make the cuts that are necessary in order for us to save ourselves. That's what's so scary to me. And I've said it before. I think it's worth saying again. That's it. I'm done. It's not a problem with populism. I mean, the elites are saying it too. There's no appetite in the DNC to cut or reform Social Security. Are you kidding? It's very unpopular. How do you get, how do you get elected saying- I don't saying, know why those Republicans- How do you get elected saying- uh, I, I hadn't seen that article. I would advise yeah. all those campaigns not to touch that rail. They're going to electrocute themselves. I think Trump has the right political instincts on this point, which is you cannot touch Social Security- as a single party effort, it has to be bipartisan. And there is no bipartisan will to do anything. So I think you're you're right about the larger point. Chamath, your thoughts? On Friedberg's uh, manifesto that 80% of the public does not want to cut spending. They're in favor of Social Security for people under 50 years old. And we have a trillion dollars in debt payments. And we're in a death spiral because we and don't we're borrowing have the will. Trillion, in 180 days, we're borrowing an extra $2 trillion. That, That's this the real point. The end of the, 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 the fiscal end of days. For at, the start, at the start of the year, the, the expectation was there we're only going to borrow $1.6 trillion for the year. Now we're borrowing $2 trillion in just these two quarters. Let me just state what I think about the downgrade. It's irrelevant. The S&P did it 13 years ago. Fitch is a marginal credit rating agency. They're at a minimum 13 years <laughs> late. At a maximum, they're just anxiety ridden <laughs> like other people are. We're always screaming that the sky is falling. So that's my first point. The second point, and the more important one, is that I, I, none of you who are always freaking out about this understand this conversation about relativism. All of these conversations are relative and you deal with them in absolutes. On a relative basis, Japan's debt to GDP is 270% and growing. On a relative basis, our debt to GDP is half of that. We are the most important economic force in the world. It is going to continue to be the most economic force in the world. And all I see actually on every single monetary basis is every other country struggling more than we are. So my question to all of the chicken littles is, 
What do you do if you're a central government where you have to have foreign reserves? Do you all of a sudden double down on the euro? Do you double down in the yuan, which is basically a proxy for being for doubling down in the US dollar? What are you supposed to do? And I never get a good answer because on a relative basis, the US will still continue to do well. I think that debt to GDP is a red herring for a lot of people. And I think that the way that people run their personal lives, which should take income to debt into consideration, I don't think applies as much to governments. And I think these things are going to march forward as a group. There's not going to be a single G8 country that all of a sudden moves away and starts printing surpluses. It happened almost as an accident, an aberration during the Clinton administration. It'll never happen again. And I think that we shouldn't worry so much because I just don't see an alternative. So give me, instead of telling me how bad this is because you think about your own life and how it would be bad if you had debt to GDP of 100, I get it. As a country, give me the alternative country. But just start with that. Can you answer that question? What is the alternative country? Yeah, where would you put your, your wealth if not the dollar? Well, let me paint a scenario that's not as dire as a collapse of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. Okay, so on this Fitch By ratings... By the way, that's not, that's not what I think happens, right? I, th- I think yeah. this is just purchasing power goes down. That's it. But go ahead, Sachs. Relative to who? Be specific. Relative to anyone. But what does, that, what does that mean, relative to anyone? Let me paint like a non-catastrophic scenario or non-apocalyptic scenario, which is what you saw in this Fitch ratings downgrade is that the bond market did move at the margins. There was a sell-off in the 10-year. And as a result, the 10-year bond yield moved up to 4.2%. So it wasn't a case of everybody shedding all of their U.S. treasuries. It's just that there were market actors at the margins who adjusted their portfolios. Okay, now, Freeberg is saying that the Treasury is going to have to do another $2 trillion bond offering. And we have trillion-dollar-plus deficits as far as the eye can see. And we've got entitlement liabilities on the horizon and then a political unwillingness to do anything about it. So the deficits are only going to get bigger and bigger. Now, what does that do? It's supply and demand. When the U.S. Treasury needs to keep issuing more and more bonds, at some point, the demand for those things gets incrementally saturated and they have to offer a higher yield. So what happens? Well, the bond rates go up. And so the 10-year goes up, like Freeberg was saying, from 4.2 to somewhere in the 5 to 7% range. And that doesn't mean the U.S. dollar is not the world's reserve currency. It just means that it gets incrementally harder and more expensive to keep financing our debt. Now, what is the result of that? Well, if I, as an investor, could theoretically get 7% from the U.S. Treasury as the risk-free rate, why would I want to take equity risk and put it in the stock market, which historically has yielded somewhere in the 5 to 7% range? So if I can get my 5 to 7% from a risk-free U.S. government bond, of course, I'm going to do that. So the discount rate on equities will go up. That means that the stock market relatively, on a relative basis, will go down. Risk capital will go down. There will risk be less capital will go capital. down. And there'll be way less risk capital available for things like venture capital and private equity, just risk taking of all kinds. And so the economy will just grow slower. It's not like there'll be a collapse. It'll just be this yeah. huge albatross. Yeah around the neck of the private sector. And this is called crowding out. Uh, here's the, I'll get, that, let me, may I give a counter here? I think if you look at the amount of sovereign wealth funds and the investment coming from around the world into US venture capital, that will keep the venture machine cranking here in America. But three charts to just look at here. Nick, pull up the first one, the 30-year Fed. So to counter this argument, really the aberration has been 2010 to 2020 when we had you know, low single digit mortgages, 3%, 4%. The majority of our lifetime, it was between five and 10. And if it's six up in the five to 10 basis, that, that's what we experienced for most of our life. And then the second chart, this is the lowest unemployment we've had in our lifetimes. If you look at the unemployment rate in the United States, 3.6 is unbelievable. And then combined with it, something we've talked about here for two years that we can't understand is when do all these jobs burn off? We peaked you know, during the post COVID era at about 11 million job openings. And then, you know, we're we're still over nine. So for there's two or three job openings for every American who wants to work. And we've shut down the borders largely, even though we have some illegal immigration coming in. It is basically shut down the United States to immigration. It's about a third of what it was. 
before Trump and Biden decided think, to shut things down. I don't think we're I don't think we're looking at the same video that that I'm seeing. Yeah, if you're looking at videos, those are very distracting. I would encourage you to look at the numbers of the actual migration into the country. It's a third of what it was. Just see what's um, happening in New York City. They got again, lines you're, around you're, the you're, blocks. You're caught up of, in clips uh, on from the border. I would just look at the raw numbers, Sachs, and the raw numbers. I know the raw numbers. Yeah, because we count them and we we count the. Well, the, the, you have to estimate them because they're illegal. But they got seven million. Again, in the last I would much two rather look years. at the numbers and the actual statistics than anecdotal videos because both sides will manipulate the heck out of them for their own purposes. But the fact is, America is just crushing it in terms of employment, and that's why we didn't have this crash landing. And the and I think the soft landing is because of employment. And I'll just end there. And if we can keep ourselves employed, and everybody from the Middle East to Japan to high net worth individuals in Europe are pouring their money into the US venture ecosystem. I think the setup here is we got to control spending, as you've said correctly, Freeberg, we get a little bit of control on spending, hopefully, and then 